Hello there, uh, this is the next in a series of technical overviews of magnetic separators manufactured by Buntings in Redditch. My name is Neil Rowson, I'm Laboratory Manager at Buntings and also Emeritus Professor of Minerals Engineering at the University of Birmingham. Today we are going to talk about the uh, magnetic disc separator, uh, which is a separator used for processing of dry powdered mainly mineral samples uh, to get a selective recovery of a high grade uh, material, usually for, for, for quite uh, complex processing flow sheets. So again, we'll start with the, with the basics about uh, magnetic uh, separation. At Buntings, we see three types of magnetic uh, properties in our materials that we process. There are ferromagnetic materials, um, here, which are materials capable of, of a high degree of alignment. Uh, for example, magnetite Fe304, which is a highly ferromagnetic mineral that often occurs in uh, mineral deposits. Um, there's also other uh, options would be things like grinding iron from milling circuits and ball mills and rod mills. These both are highly ferromagnetic materials and need to be removed um, at low field intensities, otherwise they can compromise the performance of higher magnetic susceptibility uh, separators. So, second type of material is paramagnetic materials. Uh, these tend to be metallic mineral sulfides and oxides. These are materials that are only slightly affected by an applied magnetic field. They will move towards the concentration in lines of magnetic flux. Examples of paramagnetic minerals are hematite, ilmenite, and chromite. Um, all of these uh, materials have a fingerprint magnetic susceptibility that allows us to separate them out at specific uh, magnetic field strengths and uh, field gradients. So for the example that we, uh, that we have here, then the ilmenite has a high magnetic susceptibility and hematite has a much lower magnetic susceptibility. So I can separate out ilmenite at a lower magnetic field than I can hematite and thereby get a selective separation of them. The final mineral beha magnetic behavior we see is diamagnetic materials. These are materials that are essentially non-magnetic in nature. They do not respond to the magnetic field inside our uh, separating zone of our magnetic separator and they appear as a non-magnetic material and they will move through unaffected by the magnetic field. Example of those are things like silica sands, zircon sands, rutiles, materials like those. So the disc separator itself has been around for many, many years. Um, it tends to feature uh, the difference in the, in the disc separator between other magnetic separators is that it actually works against gravity and actually lifts material off a belt uh, based upon its magnetic property. So it gives us a very uh, selective separation with a very high grade and a high recovery of material. There's very little displaced particles in the separating process. Often these machines tend to be set up in a series of disks uh, which will separate out complex materials at different magnetic susceptibilities. So some of the examples we're going to see today uh, will look at uh, three disk type separators where we're removing highly uh, paramagnetic minerals at the first disks, medium magnetic um, minerals at the second disk, weakly magnetic at the third, and then we get a non-magnetic product coming off the end, which can go for further processing. So principle of operation of the machine is basically we put a, a mono layer of material onto a belt, which is continuously fed between a rotating high magnetic, uh, high intensity magnetic disk at the top and uh, a belt and then a magnetic coil underneath that belt which creates the field uh, that we use for to, to project onto the belt surface. The, uh, the paramagnetic particles are lifted from the belt uh, onto the disc surface which is rotating and moved out of the magnetic field and discharged off down uh, separating chutes. To process this material, uh, to, to use this machine, we really need a dry free flowing powder, typically in the size range of minus two millimeters down to 45 microns. 
At the, the, as with all physical separations, the closer the size range of material, the more effective the separation we're going to get. Um, and it needs to be free from ferromagnetic uh, materials uh, because they don't discharge well from the, from the disks and will actually start sort of blocking the machine. So we tend to put our material over a drum, a low intensity drum magnet, if there's a considerable amount of ferromagnetics in the feed, or we, sit, we have a simple plate magnet situated across the, um, the feed belt to remove uh, small amounts of ferromagnetic material before it gets to the first disk for separation. As with all magnetic separation devices, uh, we, we, need, we have certain factors we need to take into account when we design and apply the unit. First of all, there's the field, uh, the feed variables that we're looking at. Again, our separation efficiency is going to be based upon the volume of particle, which is a function of the particle fire, uh, size distribution of the material and the magnetic susceptibility of the particles that we are processing. Most of the materials that we process over this type of separator will be minerals that have a paramagnetic fingerprint to them, um, which allows us to separate them out at different stages and get different concentrates. So it's quite often on these feed materials to actually get from one machine to get seven different types of product off the machine. So they make them very cost effective way of processing complex beach sands and, uh, and, and uh, niobium, tantalum, uh, columbite deposits as well. We can control at Bunting to Edge the magnetic field strength of the separator, which is H in this equation here, and the magnetic field gradient, which is the rate of change of magnetic field. Uh, and it's fair to say that the higher the magnetic field strength and the higher the field gradient, the greater the magnetic force we're going to have on a particle and the uh, more efficient the separation is going to be. So for any particle entering our belt separator, uh, our disk separator on the belt, the magnetic force imparted on it is going to be proportional to its volume or its size distribution. The magnetic susceptibility, which is given from the geological history of the mineral, the magnetic field strength generated and the magnetic field gradient generated by the magnetic separator. And as I said, the higher the magnetic force, the greater the chance of capture of the magnetic particle and the separation of it uh, from the non-magnetic feedstock of material. So field strength and field gradient are important. And this is an example of why field gradient matters. Uh, here we have a north and south magnetic pole here uh, and we have a field that is uh, aligned between these two poles here and they are parallel in nature which means across the width of the particle here whilst we might have a very strong magnetic field uh, we have no rate of change of magnetic field there's no concentration in lines of flux between to the north pole at all so this particle this paramagnetic particle here will not move no matter how strong your magnetic field is, if you have a zero field gradient, it will remain in position. The simplest way of creating a field gradient is to shape your pole, in the case of this one here, into a point uh, whereby we concentrate the line, the magnetic field when we apply it across the, the gap here and to that point there, which means there is now, if you look across the, the width of the particle, there is now a concentration in lines of flux and that paramagnetic particle will move towards that concentration of flux and be captured at this point here. So it's not just field strength, it's field gradient that is important and it's the design of the separators that gives you the field strength and the field gradient. Um, and in the case of the disc separator, we create the field gradient by having a, a grooved surface on the bottom of the disc, which looks similar to this, which has high points here that concentrate the flux and concentrate the lines of flux to get the separation that we need. So a look at the feed here. This is our feed material feed belt here. We would have it feeding as a mono layer. Um, and we have a series of revolving disks above the belt. This is the coils here, um, separate coil for each disk, front and back, as you'll see here, which is a gives you extra controllability and actually gives you six separating zones in the in the magnetic separator 
um, and that's a key design factor of the Buntings Redditch types of unit. So we have our material flowing this way on the belt as fine particles here. And as you can see, we have an inclined, uh, we have the ability to incline the, the disc as well. So the gap, the working gap here is greater than the working gap here, which means that we have a, a weaker field strength here and a stronger field strength here. So we remove the more paramagnetic minerals off and out at the front end of the disc. And as so, so our ilmenite in this case, which is highly magnetic, as I said before, is captured, moved out of the influence of the, um, uh, of the magnetic coil below and is dropped down here into the separating chute as a continuous separation process. The next, as we go to this material here, the ilmenite will have been removed and, we, and because we're lower in, in, uh, in gap here, we have a higher field strength and higher field gradient and we'll be able to separate the next mineral in our list, which will probably be garnet in this application. Uh, after it's come out of there, our non-magnetics product in this case will come off the end of the belt here. So we have the concept of a separate coil for front and back of the disc and adjustable discs position. We can tilt them or as well as having them parallel to the belt, which gives us infinite variability uh, in magnetic field strength and field gradient, which makes them very, very responsive to changes in mineral feed and, and gives you a very, very good operation. So this is an example of a production unit where we have our belt across here, our feed belt here. This is our feed material, which is a, uh, a beach sand material. This is our disc. Disc will be, will be revolving around that way. And as our material feeds in this direction, through here, our magnetic product will come off, attach itself to the belt, the, uh, the, the disc revolve around here and be discharged over that lip here into a, a feed chute for discharge from the separator. So it's a self-cleaning, continuous separating device. So here we see the, the, um, the forces on a particle on a belt type disc separator. Uh, they're somewhat simpler than some of the other separators that we've looked at before, like the uh, roll separators and the induced roll and some of the drum separators. Um, so here we have material which is fed onto the uh, via a vibratory feeder. We have a paramagnetic particle coming off the vibro feeder onto the belt. So in this case here, this is a paramagnetic particle. Uh, I have a current going to my first coil which is generating a magnetic field between the coil and the uh, disc here and the, and the grooves in the disc at the top here. And in this case, the, uh, the current that I've applied to the coil is not sufficient to lift my particle up and uh, attach it to it because the gravitational force on the particle is greater than the force to lift it at this stage. So that particle will then pass along to the back coil, uh, the, the, the back coil uh, disc assembly unit. Here I've increased the current uh, to the coil, which has generated a higher field strength and higher field gradient, which has generated a higher magnetic force on the particle. And now that is sufficient to overcome the gravitational force of the particle on the belt and will lift it up to the surface and onto the disc which will then swing that particle around and separate it out of the material. So really the force balance is a trade-off between gravity on the particle, Fg in this case, and also the, the momentum of the particle on the belt as well, F, Fv, which is a function of its mass and its velocity squared. So sometimes if I'm not getting a, a, a good enough separation, I will reduce the belt speed because that will reduce uh, the FV force, which will increase the, uh, the relevance of the FM force up here and might allow us the, uh, a separation if I'm running at maximum intensity already. So it's a trade-off between FM uh, versus FV and FG in this case. <coughs> so a feed material 
goes onto the belt in a nice mono layer across the width of the, the belt separator. Our non-magnetics are not affected by a magnetic field, come off here. In this case, I have very magnetic particles, highly paramagnetic particles, which will come off at the first disk, which I'm running again at low um, current. And then my yellow particles will be separated off out at the second, the back of the disk, which is running at a higher amperage here. So I can get a concentration of grey particles and the concentration of yellow particles uh, and then a non-magnetic uh, fraction coming off the back end. How I generate my field gradient is by having this groove surface underside of the disk, which creates our concentration in lines of flux that we've already talked about across here and up here, which will enable the particle and make the paramagnetic particle lift off and up and be removed. So we're overcoming gravity. And that means we get very little entrainment of non-magnetic material because we're lifting off a belt. There's no chance of entrainment because it's got to be physically moved up. So it gives you a very clean product and high grades and high recovery, which is what you need for this sort of um, separator and the applications it's used in. So the principle of operation, just to summarize, is feed material, it's got to be dry and free flowing from a hopper onto a vibro feeder. Mono layer, again, as with all physical separations, goes under a high intensity magnetic disc. Magnetic particles are lifted off the belt and removed when our non-magnetic particles pass through unaffected and come off the end of the belt. So it's a continuous processing uh, option for dry, free flowing powders often of complex makeup. So how material is discharged uh, is we have these discharge plates here uh, or wiper plates. So our material will have our paramagnetic particles on here that have been lifted up. They moved round by the, um, by the uh, motion of the revolving disc. And when they reach the point here, they hit the, the, uh, the plate and are removed accordingly into the discharge. Uh, shoot. The, the, as we get further out from the disc and out of the separating zone and off, uh, the, the disc is wider than the belt. So at this point here, the magnetic field's dropping anyway as well. So some particles will just drop off of their own accord and others that are, that are higher in magnetic susceptibility may just remain there and be pulled off by this uh, discharge plate here. So it's continuous separation. Um, so we can get six, con uh, six concentrates and the non-magnetic fraction from a single feed material like a, uh, a beach sand. So we would feed on this way and the first disc would take off the most magnetic mineral. Second disc, number two, would be the, the next magnetic susceptibility. And likewise, so our non-magnetics from that will go to a disc that's running at higher intensity to give me concentrate three, concentrate four, to the final disc here, which will give me concentrate five and six, and our non-mags will come off at the back end there. So machine variables, belt speed will control the feed rate of the separator, which is important for industrial applications, but I must maintain a mono layer of material. The disc speed, we control the disc speed because of, uh, if you've got a high degree of paramagnetic material you're removing, then you need really to, to run at a higher disk speed to allow it to be removed out of the field and to allow a mono layer of material to be attached to the, um, the disk grooves. So we tend to, so if we have a high percentage of mineral to remove, we will run at a higher disk speed to make sure that we've always got a clear surface for the particles to attach to. Disc height above the belt will be determined by the particle size distribution of the feed. Uh, in the rule of thumb, the, the lower the uh, disc height, the higher the, mag the maximum magnetic field strength you're going to get off the machine. So at about a two millimeter gap, you're going to get 1.4 Tesla off that machine with a very high field gradient because of the grooves in the disc. The final one and the one we use most is coil current. We have a completely variable coil current uh, applied to the front and the back of each disc, which means that we have uh, an infinitely variable uh, separation device that we can control and tweak as your feed grades change or the mineralogy of your deposit changes. 
So it really is uh, a machine that can allow, that can either be left to run automatically, or if you have a variable feed, you can change and tweak accordingly as that changes as well. So just a, a, another quick look at the disk uh, and the separation. These are the coils here and the magnetic circuit here. The iron circuit is that bit there going around. As you can see, there's the belt and there's my disk. I have my separating zones here. I'm feeding on. I'm separating out that way and back that way. And if you look at a side view, this will give you an idea of how the discharge works. My particles are lifted off, move out here and come off these uh, via the, uh, the wiper plates here. And also this area here, the magnetic field is beginning to drop off a bit. So uh, particles will automatically drop off as well. So it's a completely self-cleaning type of unit. So here we can see an uh, industrial uh, unit in operation on a beach sand deposit. Uh, and here we can see that particles, this is more particles being lifted and discharged from the, uh, the separator. The disc is revolving around this way relatively slowly. Uh, and in this case, garnet, which is a pinky type material, which is paramagnetic in nature, has been lifted off the belt and is beginning to come out of the influence of the magnetic field. And you can see a discharge plane here as it's going down the, the discharge suit. You can also see at this point here, the, the discharge wiper, the black um, composite material here, that's the adjusting panel uh, uh, um, for it, uh, which we can move in and out. And material, the final material that's more magnetic susceptible is, is coming to that point there and discharge and being discharged and knocked off the, the disc as it, as it revolves around at this point here. So we're getting off at this stage, a concentrate of a, a medium susceptibility garnet that's being removed and self-cleaned from the, the separator. So you can see it's quite a fluid and dynamic process um, the, the discharge of, from the separator. So we'll talk a bit about applications. They're mainly in the uh, minerals industry, or like sometimes used in the abrasives industry as well, for cleaning uh, materials or recycling um, uh, mineral abrasives, things like garnet, sand and things. Um, so the, the, the majority of applications we see uh, are for separating weakly magnetic minerals from high quality quartz sands for things like fiber optics to manufacture or semiconductor manufacture. Um, the processing of the ilmenite beach sands, these tend to be quite complex uh, uh, products. And here we can get a high quality ilmenite, which is an iron titanate off the machine. Um, monazite, zircon separation, garnet concentration, and also wolframite cassiterite operation in uh, tin processing. We're also seeing a lot of applications in tantalum production now, as tantalum is used more and more in, uh, as a capacitor in mobile phones and in, in auto electric cars and, and things like that. So we have a large number of these units operating around the world, uh, a lot of them in the African continent, looking at columbite tantalite processing and also beach sand processing in South Africa as well. So we're going to look at a video example of a separation. This is featuring a three disc high intensity electromagnetic uh, disc separator. Don't, like, the number of discs you have is purely dependent on the number of materials you have in your feed material. If you have one magnetic phase and a non-magnetic phase, then you would need one disc. But often these machines are used on very complex beach sand deposits that will have five or six different minerals present in them. So we have, our, we have our, our industrial scale unit. It has three high intensity discs all set at different intensities. Uh, the belt width is 350 millimeters, uh, which is the maximum uh, that uh, can be made uh, technically. Uh, the disc is set furthest from the feed material and at the lowest current to allow separation of the most magnetic mineral phase. Second disc uh, is set for medium magnetic materials. Then the final disc is uh, for very weakly magnetic uh, minerals, giving us a non-magnetic product coming out at the end. And in this case, this is a South African beach sand deposit. It does have some magnetite in it, which is ferromagnetic. And as I said at the beginning of the talk, 
we remove that with a plate magnet because there's only very little of it before we go to the high intensity separation. If we have the magnetite in the process uh, and don't remove it, then it, will, it won't discharge well from the first disc and it, in, and it inhibits the separation efficiency. So ilmenite, which is an iron titanate, is a highly powerful magnetic mineral. That's going to be separated at the first disc. Garnet, which is a, an iron uh, aluminosilicate, is a medium paramagnetic material, will be separated at the second disc. Monazite, which is a rare earth phosphate material, is uh, para, weakly paramagnetic because of the presence of some of these rare earth materials like neodymium, and is removed at the final magnet. The non-magnetic phase is a mixture of silica sand, zircon and rutile, which will go for further processing. And that might be by froth flotation, or it might be by electrostatic separation that would separate out the rutile and then, uh, from the, these other two phases. So a saleable products go from this material. We have one product, which is a beach sand, naturally occurring in South Africa. I can get a highly paramagnetic ilmenite that will go for TiO2 manufacture. I can get garnet that will go for abrasives use in shot firing materials. So, uh, uh, and, and shot blasting materials. My monazite is a highly, highly valuable material that will go for rare earth processing and toll refining, probably in the Far East. Um, and it has a, a very high value per ton. And my final non-magnetic materials here, the rutile, again, is used for TiO2, uh, titanium dioxide manufacture, and it has a high value. Zircon sands is used in the refractory industry and our silica sand, whilst it has a nominal value for building materials and things like that. So you can take a product um, and create a, that is a waste material from a, from a beach, basically, and produce all of these materials, that some of which are very high value, using one machine. Uh, so you can see that it, it, the, the potential for payback on the, on the capital spend for this is a very short payback time. So video, uh, hopefully we'll have a look at a quick video um, of the machine running. So here we have uh, the vibro feeder feeding across the width of the industrial unit. This is my disc moving in that direction, separating off material uh, there. And here I'm, at the first disc I'm removing my ilmenite, a black mineral. Here we're separating out the pink garnet to go for shock blasting. And here we have the light brown monazite, which will be a toll refined for, for rare earth elements. That's a, a, a very high value indeed. A remaining non-magnetic material will come off the end and go for further processing. So you can see a very, very simple um, process indeed. And this is the final buckets for separation. So my first disc gave me two concentrates of ilmenite here, dark mineral, of sufficient grade to sell as a feedstock for titanium dioxide production via the sulfate route. Here we have our abrasive materials, which will go for shot blasting um, of, 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 uh, in, in the engineering sector. And here we have my brown, uh, light brown monazite, which is a, a, a radioactive mineral, rare earth mineral phosphate, which will be refined for its cerium, its lanthanum, its neodymium, which are used to make, it's the principal source of neodymium boron ion magnets used in the magnet industry, um, and also its praseodymium. And all these elements are very highly valued, um, but also uh, in great demand for uh, for lightweight motor materials and magnetic materials and, and, and complex electronic materials as well. So they are key elements for the, um, for the development of mobile phones, electric vehicles, and, and, uh, and lots of areas where you're using lightweight magnetic materials. So typical applications for this sort of magnetic material, the, the disc separator, are cleaning of silica sands, feldspars, and nephilim cyanates for the high-end um, uh, semiconductor industry and glass sand industry, processing a heavy mineral beach sands like the South African one we've looked at, 
Monazite zircon separation, again for recovery of the rare earth elements there. Garnet concentration and purification, also recycling as well, once they've been used, so you, you make the most of your material. Wolframite cassiterite separation, used a lot for that to get a high grade of uh, tin, which can then be used for, uh, for to recover tin from a smelting process. And our columbite tantalite separation, which they're becoming more and more used for, especially in Africa. So a key, you know, this is a, 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 a picture of a three disc unit that was used for processing coltane, which is a combination of columbite and tantalite. It's used for tantalite upgrading and separation where tantalum element is used in uh, capacitors for mobile phones and electric vehicles. So tantalum is a key element in the mobile phone uh, generation um, and uh, is, is a material that has a very, very high value. So again, what we would achieve coming off of these this tier is various grades of, of, of tantalum um, uh, compounds that can go for processing and upgrading. Um, and this is a, uh, an application that is beginning to become more and more common, more prevalent in Africa, but also beginning to, people are beginning to look at European ore deposits as well as a source of this, these valuable metals and this technique has applicability for those sorts of deposits as well. So here we're going, this is a longer video um, that is going to look at the commissioning of a disc separator uh, itself and my colleague Phil Tree will talk you through the adjustable, uh, how you adjust the different settings on a disc separator and I thought this would be interesting for you to see and get some idea of the controllability of the machine and how it is infinitely variable to allow you to optimise your separation at all stages. So here's the discharge coming off the end there. The machine is designed so that disc number one and disc number three rotate in a clockwise direction when viewed from above. Disc number two rotates in an anti-clockwise direction. We now come on to setting the disc speeds for the three individual discs, which can be set at different speeds. The disc motors are turned on and then adjusted accordingly to get the required speed. Each one has a separate control. By adjusting the magnetic intensity, six different products can be separated from the feed material, as can be seen below. The magnetic intensity can be varied by adjusting the height of the disc above the belt. The leading edge is always at a greater gap than the edge at the back, so you have different intensities on the same disc. Slightly lower at the front leading edge and higher at the rear edge. So the intensity can be adjusted by lifting the disc higher or lower. The closer to the coils, the lower the disc, the higher the intensity of the magnet. The intensity of the magnets can be adjusted further by the control panel by simply increasing the current to the magnet coils. This is shown on the dial here. So the amp reading will indicate the strength of the magnet. Finally, 
we need to set the vibratory feeder to actually feed the material onto the belt. Again, this is started with the start button, and the feed rate of the feeder can be adjusted using the variable control. To set the feed of material from the hopper onto the vibratory feeder, this gate can be adjusted to make sure the material has a controlled flow onto the feeder. It is adjusted up and down and secured by the bolts underneath. Okay then, hopefully that's a bit of interest. Uh, just to finish with a few key facts for the uh, disc separator. First of all, you have a very precise separation efficiency. It works against gravity, it's lifting material off, so therefore you're gonna get a very clean magnetic product from it. Uh, it can process very complex feeds in one machine. We can get up to seven products from, uh, from one machine if we have a three disc separator. That's six different magnetic products and one non-magnetic product. Very high grade and recovery because we have an infinitely variable separation. We have process flexibility. The magnetic field strengths can be varied between, at, at the lowest, probably 1,000 Gauss to 14,000, 1 1.4 Tesla at the lowest operating gap and highest current. It has a very robust design. These machines have been operating um, in uh, around the world for 40 or 50 years and uh, have very few moving parts uh, and are designed to uh, to last for a very very long time. Yeah. So that concludes this is the final thing here is a picture of a laboratory unit uh, which some laboratories around the uh, mineral processing laboratories around the world um, have as a quality control and a research tool for processing. Uh, material. So we also have a laboratory unit available. So I hope that was of interest for you. Uh, thank you for listening and if you'd like any test work done or any further questions please contact us via our website. Thank you.